I'm talking today to Ed Hoffman of Knowledge Strategies. Many of you will know Ed as the former NASA Chief Knowledge Officer and the person who uh, helps to set up the NASA uh, Academy on Project and Program Leadership after the Challenger disaster. And I'm talking to Ed about the whole subject of knowledge sharing in organisations. And I thought I'd start with this concept, which I don't know if you coined the phrase, uh, Ed, but this idea of knowledge engagement and just ask you what that means um, and why it's important in project management terms. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for, for letting me, me talk to you. This is, uh, I enjoy doing this. So there's a couple of things that I learned. One of it is when I was appointed to be NASA's chief knowledge officer across the whole agency, it was a new position. It was a new structure. It was a new organization. And so the common question I would get is, why do we need a chief knowledge officer? What is this thing called knowledge? And what is the, the core of it? And through a lot of the work that I did, I was at NASA 33 years, principally providing support to our missions, preparing the individuals, preparing the teams, trying to increase the likelihood of our projects being successful. And the more I thought about what is it that a chief knowledge officer does, or certainly what I was going to emphasize, broadly two things. And one of them is engagement. How do we get people in an organization or on a team to be excited, to be passionate, to be focused, to be interested, to be committed to being successful? I would see teams where they had that and they would tend to be successful. And I would see teams for different reasons that didn't have people really there. They really weren't engaged, and I saw the problems of that. So to me, the notion of knowledge engagement is one of the, the two critical things is how do you get that energy, the focus, the excitement, the attention being paid by people. The other one was the accelerated learning, that we're in an age where learning has to continuously be happening, and so we have to be adaptive and fast and able to learn. So those were the two concepts that I, I started talking about. I don't know how it is in the US, but certainly projects here in the UK, they talk a little bit about learning and they talk a little bit about the, the team and the makeup of the team, but they don't uh, necessarily put real focus on this idea of engaging the teams or, or certainly not on this idea of accelerated learning. So how have you have you seen that work in projects? I mean, you, you talked about teams that have been engaged and teams that aren't engaged. Do you want to give me a couple of examples of, of both? Yeah. And so, uh, again, this really came to me as a practitioner. I, my background was academic. I got my doctorate from Columbia University. So, so I was familiar with theories and research and value it. But working at NASA for 33 years is it's an engineering, it's a science, it's a program organization. So I had to be able to, to make things concrete and applicable. And so what I saw were these principles, you know, playing out. So there's an example I sometimes give in my workshops is, you know, two shuttle examples, okay, very, very large programs, one of them uh, a case study failure, and the other a case study of success, uh, largely the same people, the same mission, the same drivers, the leadership was, was different. In the one that uh, that I focused on, Columbia, the the uh, the Columbia failure, which was obviously a, a loss of life and an awful situation. We were in a situation where tiles came off of the uh, the shuttle on on takeoff. It hit the uh, the wing at the uh, at a dangerous angle, did serious damage, and then a week or so later on re-entry, the shuttle came apart, killing the crew and and all of that. So what do we mean by a lack of engagement? It's not just an enthusiasm or a passion because on virtually every project or program I saw passionate and dedicated and smart people working it. But engagement also means that you're, you're committed to listening to what people have to say, that you're going beyond the boundaries of just your direct people and, uh, and finding answers that in the case of the Columbia failure, we didn't we didn't accept the videos, the photo of the liftoff from another U.S. government agency, and we excluded that piece of data. We had for years had data on the challenges of losing shuttle tiles, and it led to the coining of the term normalization of deviance, where something goes wrong outside of 
the parameters of risk, but because it does not lead to a direct failure on a mission, that deviation becomes normalized. And of course, eventually, those, enough of those things happen, you have a serious failure. So that was a situation where we did not communicate uh, enough to each other. Engineers raised issues. They were not listened to. They were not heard. We had data that you know we, we were accepting risk that we should not have. So in, in, in ways, I see that as a lack of an engaged structure or a system. A number of years later, I was doing support with one of the shuttle missions, and I forget the to get the, the sequencing of it, but it was one of the last missions. And on a previous flight, they had a problem. It was considered a small problem. It was not considered flight, uh, you know, sensitive or dangerous. And yet uh, they followed the, the process. They, uh, they listened to the engineering team. They listened to safety. They recommended not launching because even though they agreed that they didn't feel it posed a significant threat, they still could not answer what led to some of the problems. And so they threw, you know, cost a lot of money. We threw resources to it. We involved industry. Uh, we had a time frame and requirements for when launch would be appropriate. And it was a team that was very engaged, asking questions, and had a successful outcome. So I, I, I call that one a tale of two shuttles, uh, one that uh, obviously led to a tragic end and the other that had a tremendous success. And uh, what I say is that the same people, the same structure, the same kind of mission, and yet different outcomes. And again, I think that has to do with the, the difference being the, the extended comfort with engagement and with learning and taking the time and the resources to, to do that. And how do you go about that? Um, if you're working on a, on a major project, uh, how, how do you decide that something is genuinely an issue rather than just something that happens? I mean, what, what sort of triggers do you have for, for kind of identifying those kinds of things? Because otherwise you could get caught up, for, as you say, for years, just looking at things that really ha have no impact or will it never have an impact. That's right. And of course, then you can never do your, you never launch, right? So you have a risk. Uh, risk management is one of the key professions that, I, that needs to be closely tied to any knowledge effort. I work very closely with the folks in safety and risk management and, and uh, try to understand for a project program, mission, what is the risk profile? And that will indicate what are the things we should be looking at. If you see that and things are ignored, for different reasons, you have to really look closely at why are we why are we not focusing on that? You know, you can go years back to the first Hubble launch, which was uh, a failure based on the the optic optical problems it had, and there were tests that were not done for the sake of cost that led to that problem. Well, again, that's a case where we know the things that we say we're going to do. We have it documented. Projects typically have a lot of you know, a lot of scrutiny in terms of the process and the approach. And when you ignore things that are critical, that's when I think you have to be open to really in-depth discussion. The other thing, the, the fundamental thing that I would say is it comes down to conversations. High-performance teams and organizations have very active conversations. Uh, I call it the sound of success. The sound of success is people talking, arguing, laughing, they're engaging, they're walking around, there's opening of doors, there's people talking in, uh, with each other. The, uh, the lack of that is usually uh, the biggest indicator that we're increasing the likelihood of failure. And, and in terms of learning from third parties and from outside organizations, right. I mean, you talked about not picking up um, on, the, on the data that, you were, you, that was shared with you, the, the, the video data that was shared with you, but but this, this whole question of learning lessons from other organizations seems to be qu quite a conundrum to me because lessons learned are, are very much contextualized for the specific organization. They're, they're not often very easy to, to unwrap and to really um, right. take in the learning. H have you any advice, any thoughts on this whole question of how you learn lessons from one organization to another? Yeah, so there's differences. If I'm looking for something specific to a project, then at that point, I'm doing something that's within the team. 
and that's very specific. That's contextual, uh, and that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate learning. You have to do it for your project. You have to do it for your team and organization. When I go external, I'm looking for lessons or ideas, perhaps innovations or things that may be applicable. And I think that's very, very powerful because it's easier to learn from others. You don't have the political uh, pressures, uh, but it's more of, in my view, it's more of a trying to see if are there patterns or there trends that apply from this other world to mine. So it's, uh, I think it's important to do, but it's a different uh, degree of, of focus. In terms of, of kind of obstacles to knowledge sharing, I, I found that uh, a lot of organizations, they're reasonably good at sharing knowledge internally, they're, they're much less good at sharing it externally. I think often a kind of risk aversion comes in and they're worried about um, somehow letting their intellectual property go or somehow how exposing their, their organization to risk or to litigation. Well, what are your thoughts on that in, or in terms of how, how can we encourage organizations, you know, some of them working on the biggest public projects to actually share knowledge between each other? Right. I think that really comes down to a, there has to be a strategic discussion. There has to be consideration for what do we want to share? What is open and we want to exchange and make available and what are those areas that we need to you know to keep internal but i think there needs to be that discussion there needs to be that uh, otherwise you confuse people and in many cases people will will defer to sharing less even things that they could talk about because they want to be extra cautious you know I, when i worked at nasa obviously there are things in the engineering technical technologies industry uh, patents that uh, I could not talk to externally. And then there are things in terms of learning, in terms of our process, in terms of our models that were open, that were written about, that were available for others. And so you, you just have to make it clear to people what is uh, appropriate to being discussed and what are the things that, that need to stay within the organization. Right, right. So some kind of t transparency policy, as you say, so that says uh, this is fine, that you shouldn't share so it's it's very clear yeah excellent good if if i can close with a, a, a final question which is really looking forward into the future how, how do you see this idea of knowledge engagement developing in the future and and if you look forward sort of five or ten years what sort of things do you think organizations will be doing in order to to share and in order to to create these kinds of engaged teams i retired from nasa a year ago but I've been working with organizations directly now and consulting and universities. And it's been very interesting to me that I get many requests for organizations, big name organizations that are just at the beginning of starting a knowledge program. They're trying to understand it. They're trying to see how do they, they do these things. So I think there are a few things that are definitely happening for the, the future. First of all, we're living in an international world. And despite what our efforts there are, that kind of nationalized thing. I think the nature of programs and projects is increasingly going to be global. It's going to be international. Partly because of that, there's an increase in complexity. The big challenge now for the success of a team or a project or organization is how do we work with people from different countries, with different age groups, with different discipline skills? How do we communicate? How do we share? How do we optimize? And so these are things that are taking us into a few areas. One, that's obvious, is digitalization. The whole issue is around what are the technologies and tools that can help us understand the analytics, the social media, the, the sources of understanding what are the things we need to do to be successful. I think that also simultaneously drives uh, a second big focus on the importance for organizations to have a strategy What's their strategy of not only the, the work that they're doing and their goals, but also how they approach knowledge? How do they approach what are the things that they need to be learning? How do they make sure that there's a sharing that is taking place? And I think related to that to me is the importance of conversation and having forums where people are talking and sharing and exchanging with each other. So I think digitalization, I think conversation, I think this whole notion of looking for ways to engage and having fast learning is going to be the response to increasingly complex and fast missions and programs that organizations are doing. Thank you ever so much. You finished by uh, 
talking about forums for people to share knowledge, which is precisely what the Major Projects Knowledge Hub is. So it was a very nice uh, way to round off the interview. So um, thank you very much, Ed. Thank you for your time and for your input. My pleasure.